hand gestures because this, when you scroll up on Facebook, it sees this first bit. So you have to look like animated. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I get it. Yeah, you okay. gotta look like you're. Like That's you're like engaging. the snapshot or something. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Hi, yeah. everybody. Um, we're talking with John Tobin. Uh, we're having these conversations around the conference, uh, where the virtual uh, event, where we're just taking some questions and continuing the chat. So that is why we're here, uh, John. While we wait for people to log on, did you lock your kids in a room? Um, I locked them in a room, but I, I'm hearing them call me right now. So <laughs> we don't know how long that will last. And, you know, there's multiple exits. So we'll see what happens. We have like 13 animals in our house. And oh, okay. the only two whose noises ring through, like my wife used a blender yesterday and it didn't come through on the microphone, but her bird screaming does and the yes. dog does. So the bird yeah. and the dog are currently locked with my wife in her room with a blender Okay, not really with a blender. Okay. That'd yeah. Be, that'd be a weird thing. So, um, hi, everybody. So, here's what we're going to do. John and I are going to have a conversation about productizing. And just to super get it out of the way, all that means is you're taking services and turning them into something that can be sold over and over again and get some marginal cost gains, which we'll talk about what that means. But um, anyway, that's it's just taking services and turning them into something that's duplicatable. I don't even know what the word is. Replicable. Replicable. Yeah. Nicely done. Uh, yeah. This is why I like hanging out with lawyers. So um, so we're talking about how you do that. It's about creating new revenue streams, not changing practice areas, not dumping all the expertise that you have right now, but, but finding new ways to generate revenue. So remember, you can below, you can put questions, comments, what you're trying, what you've seen other people try, how somebody might do this um, ethically, logistically. Um, in a way that's market competitive. Uh, we'll talk about all of that. So make sure you put your questions and comments below. And um, I think this might be the last session, actually. I think you might be the last one. Oh, yeah? Okay, cool. <clears throat> yeah, it was you and Mark Homer were the last two because you and Mark Homer ignored my emails. Um, do you have a Do you have a VA to blame who filters your emails? Uh, no, no, no. Blame. Mark does. It, yeah, Mark the buck does. stops here. Yeah, you know? Mark blamed his VA. Some poor gal in the Philippines or something, and Mark's like, the VA. So mm. threw her right under the bus. So anyway, so we're going to talk about different ways to um, capture your knowledge. So John, um, you and I had a long conversation about kind of the philosophy behind this, but I want to get into the tactics a little bit. Tell me about your firm. You serve creatives, which first, how are you defining that? Yeah, so I define it broadly, right? So creative, I mean, it can mean anything, really. So, I mean, we can start from the obvious choices. An artist, so like a fine artist or um, an app developer, an architect. Um, but, you know, it goes... Most businesses, I, f I find as I do this, have some sort of creative aspect. So unless it's like something like a pure commodity, like you're you know, buying and selling, you know, bushels of grain or something, um, there's always a creative aspect. There's always a brand. There's always um, creative material that's generated, whether it's product photography or graphics or marketing material. There's always something creative. So it's actually super broad. You know, I mean, I don't think we've ever turned anyone away. Um, because they don't meet that definition. But um, I assume I mean, that branding allows allows them to pick whether they're your people or not. Like being out loud yeah. about it puts the yeah, ball that, in their court. Yeah. That's what it does. And, and kind of, you know, what it does is it more says, okay, the emphasis is here. Like you're going to get the most value if you're sort of falling in that inner circle. So if you're an artist, if you're a app developer, if you're a startup, if you're an architect or a graphic designer, if you're something like that, you're going to get the most value out of it. That said, if you're not in that camp, if you're not quite in that circle, um, we there's still a lot we can do for you. So, you know, for us, it's, it's the branding is what connecting with those right customers that we can do the most for. As you're talking, I'm pulling up your website. I'm going to share it real quick. Um, so I'm assuming that in terms of services, your principal. I'm going to hit your services button now Sweet. because because I can. I'm assuming in terms of services, you're mostly doing like, yeah, business setup, trademark registration. Um, so a lot of small business stuff. Yeah, small business stuff. I mean, really, over the years, we narrowed it down. I mean, what you see on there 
is pretty much what we do, right? So trademark registration, business setup, contracts, and ongoing legal advice, which is another thing that we do. Um, we, we actually do have sort of a hidden practice area, which is film and television council. So we're production council for a lot of um, independent films and documentaries. So that, that's mostly my partner. Um, but most of that business comes word of mouth. So uh, we actually don't advertise it. Well, let's talk about those because I think, do you do any hourly billing at all? Once in a while. I mean, I would say probably maximum five to 10% of our revenue is hourly. Okay. And so, um, I mean, that's, that's sort of easy to do with a business formation because you can define yeah. the scope really well. I will say, I keep hearing people tell me that you can't do that with litigation and that's malarkey. I did it for eight yeah. years or whatever. Um, but it is harder. I will say it is harder. It is and, harder. Yeah. And you definitely, uh, the way Ed Kless put it was, you you don't think about the individual case. You think about the portfolio of cases. And sure, a case yeah. might go overboard. But if on balance in some in the cases, and, and if later you're like, wait, looking back, that kind of case is really sucking up too much time, then you just change you your portfolio. You don't do that kind of case. Right. Yeah. So um, it's very doable. But anyway. Yeah. And it, and it also becomes about screening. You know, I, I think one of the things that really helped us, you know, in doing flat fee is just making sure that whatever the person expects from us, that's going to be a fit. Right. So if they, you know, if they're like, Hey, I want you to go and negotiate this big deal and, you know, be sort of my consigliere for this whole thing that I'm doing. Um, we may not be the right fit for them. We might be, okay. but, but it's also like, Hey, if that's not something that can, you know, we can serve under our flat fee model, we, we, we just tell people. Hmm. So let's take, for example, this, this, the first, uh, service, which is business formation stuff. Right. Are you, you know, a lot of lawyers are doing that where it's traditional, pay me for the document and the little bit of counsel in there. And I go do those things. A productized way to do that might be to say, okay, everybody who's got business set up has umpteen questions about it. Let me yeah. go figure out how to pre-answer all those questions in a content thing or whatever. And I include that in the flat fee. Are you doing things like that with this? We're getting there. I mean, that's okay. been our you know, our intention for a long time. But one of the things, and just because you know we're at home all the time and recording all the time, um, we've been ramping that up. So we've been making a lot of videos on legal topics that we right now share with our um, subscription program members, and and we're actually doing a lot more of those videos because yeah, the thing is we get the same questions over and over. I mean, it might just be like, how do I do my taxes for the first time if I have an LLC? I have no idea. Um, I've answered that question probably five hundred times. Why not just record it? Yeah, and we'll talk about the subscription program, but that's interesting. I think, you know, if you've got the subscription program and it's just part of it is this bundle of videos, to be able to then say, all right, let me bundle these five videos that are really topical for business setup. Yeah, then you got I, it. Then I can say, as soon as you hire me for business setup stuff, you're also going to get the included five videos of me and, you know, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. Just in terms of, you know, theory... Real quick, I want to explain what marginal cost is so that you guys get the principle of why this stuff is worth it. Marginal cost is basically how much does the next thing cost for you to make, right? So if I've got shoes, um, if I'm Nike and I'm making shoes, there's a bunch of upfront costs. There's, you know, getting LeBron, there's design stuff, there's testing, there's setting up the, you know, facility, there's getting materials, whatever. So it's really costly up front. And a lot mm -hmm. of these productized things, there's a lot of work up front. You're recording Absolutely. a bunch of videos and you're designing and you're doing a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. But but after you've made a million pairs of shoes, the million and first pair of shoes costs you nothing, right? Like it just you've just got kids in China. Okay, maybe that's not fair. Uh, if it's Nike, I'm trying to make a Nike joke, uh, but uh, let's pretend that Nike was paying people appropriately in their factory and they were slightly more expensive to make than Nike shoes actually are. But by the time you get to the millionth pair of shoes, it costs almost nothing to make it. What John and I are talking about is trying to do that in your law firm as well to make it so, yes, there's work to do up front as opposed to hourly, which always costs you the same amount. Hourly always costs you an hour, right? No matter where you are in your career, if you're billing hourly, an hour costs you an hour. It's the same. You never profit more off of that. And by the way, even if your hourly rate goes up most of the time, most lawyers are just doing cost of living increases is all that's changing with their hourly rate. Um, but anyway, the point is to try to get to this leverage, to get to this advantage. So what you're doing with the business setup thing is you decide, I'm going to do a flat fee scope thing. And I'm going to keep building value into that thing 
so that by the time I get my you know thousandth person hiring me for a business setup, it doesn't take a lot of lift, and it's actually more valuable than it was the first time I did it, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it can actually be better. It can be a more consistent experience. It can be a more valuable experience for the person who's receiving it because we're not doing everything ad hoc. We've sort of preloaded a lot of the decision making. Right. So Jonathan's got a couple questions about specifics and I'm going to get to those, Jonathan. First, I want to go through some of the services to get down to the point that you're at. Um, those are good questions. So um, let's talk about trademark registration. I assume that's roughly similar in the sense that you've got some bundle of here's you know the actual service here's some counsel around the service in a defined scope and probably going to get to the point where here's a bunch of pre-made content that helps you make decisions around the trademarks is that fair yeah that's right i mean they all sort of follow this this similar template you know people are looking for a result so we're going to give them that but then we also realized okay um they need counsel you know so they want to just make sure they're making the correct decision um you know they're not just looking to fill out a form and submit it they want to be like hey i want to get this right i want to do my business right and then they also need some education right so there's uh, you know for us to be effective there has to be this base level of knowledge they need to understand what it is they're getting and why they're doing it yeah and i've seen with these productizing services definitions you know it's fairly loose but some people will say if you include two hours of legal counsel that takes a human, it's not productizing. And some people say, yes, it is. It's just a bundled defined scope thing. I don't think we, John and I, care about how precise you are in this definition. No. Um, but the idea is instead of, hey, you're coming to me, I have no idea what's going to happen. <laughs> you know, uh, Ed Kless gave the example of you don't want to go in with a brain surgeon and the brain surgeon at the beginning say – Anything could happen. Who knows? Right. You know? uh, people are just tired of that. So this is yeah. a way to define your scope and and your services. And again, eventually you can leverage the fact that you've done this a thousand times by just capturing your work as you go. So I assume it's the same with contract creation. I want to get to the creator's legal program, and this will answer some of the questions that John has. Um Sweet. You know, he he asked about how do you structure your fat, flat fees for providing outside general counsel work? Is that what the legal pro, is that what the subscription product is? Yeah, that's what it is. So it's meant to uh, to fill the gaps, right? So as you can see, we have those three main categories, and I would say that you know, for most businesses, we're helping. Um, the things they ask for are going to usually fall into those main categories and, or often, you know, like they're, it's pretty uh, predictable, pretty sort of consistent. Right. Um, but then there are sort of random questions that people have, you know, Hey, I just got this weird letter from my landlord. Can you help me understand what it means? Or, um, thinking of bringing my cousin on and want to give him some equity. How do I do that? You know, so these are things that we haven't set up a flat fee for. So my answer to that question is often, hey, that sounds cool. We actually have a program that can give you that legal support. Um, why don't you join? And then let's discuss and sort of get you some advice on that you know, or, or ongoing advice even, you know, and, and come back to us and tell us what's going on so we can almost proactively help you. So help me understand that. Is that a lot of times the general counsel type work is whatever comes into your business, right? So. This I would define as an audience focused, you know, you're a solutions engine. People come to you for not expertise per se. You're not, I'm assuming that they're not calling you in these general counsel things to say, how do I dispose of nuclear waste in a way that is compliant? You, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. How are you setting the lines for this is within my solutions engine right. set of tasks and this is outside? So again, it's, it's setting expectations. I mean, um, you know, and, and, even before someone you know signs up we sort of tell them here's here's the kind of work that we do so um you know if if it's something that's completely outside of what we do so a good example would be like music so like when you get really hardcore into music industry contracts i i don't want to help with that because um you know good music lawyers that's all they do they don't do anything else they just do music industry contracts so i'll tell people who sign up hey i can get you sort of oriented in the right direction and i can give you a referral so i sort of act as a um, primary care physician so again um, i might say hey it looks like you have a heart problem um, i can see that i can right. see there's something wrong with the way your heart is beating um, I'm not a heart surgeon, I'm not a cardiologist, but I'm going to refer you to one and I suggest that you talk to them now. Which is what in-house counsel does anyway. I yeah, mean, in, exactly. In-house counsel doesn't handle everything. They they just right. get up to a point and part of that 
expertise is saying, I don't know, right? Like, yeah. getting to the point that you say it's time to go to somebody else. Uh, Nina Zhang, and I w- wanted to ask you about this. Nina Zhang asked, how did you come up with 95 a month as the price? Is that the price of this product or is that a different product? Uh, $95 a month is the price for our subscription program. So um, we just decided semi-arbitrarily that it was going to be $95. That was sort of a... And, and sorry, when you say subscription... So there's general counsel work, right? Which I think a lot of that market that I've seen, depending on how you bundle it, is sort of a target at 500 a month or whatever. Yeah. But this, it sounds like, I'm assuming at 95 a month, you're mostly relying on the content to provide most content, of the but, but also phone calls. I mean, so what I would probably do in this conversation is almost remove the concept of general counsel. Hmm. Um, because it doesn't mean anything to, to the, to the people I work with, right? They don't know what a general counsel is. They don't care too much. Um, but what they do care about is, Hey, for $95 a month, um, if I have a legal question, I can call a lawyer. Um, if I get a contract sent to me by someone I'm going to work with, I can send it to a lawyer and have them give me notes on it. Um, so that's what they're getting for the $95 a month. So we basically said, yeah, we, we did see that, you know, we could do general counsel for like 2000 a month, 3000 a month. That's easy. That's called a retainer and lawyers have been doing it for years. Right. But we're like, how can we productize and systematize enough so that we can offer enough legal advice, enough legal support to really small businesses for 95 bucks a month where they can afford it. You know, the point is, is any business should be able to afford that. So not a retainer relationship where people can call you whenever they want to. No. And, and, and part of, you know, part of it is also structuring the way that that relationship will work. So, um, you know, we've had, I've, I've had a few people who I've had to explain, no, it does not mean you can text me on the weekend, right? What, it, what, what unlimited phone calls means is you have access to my calendar. You can schedule literally unlimited phone calls, right? So, so, but it's during the time when I'm working and when I'm available and not doing something else, right? And, and you know, we obviously make a lot of time available during the week. So it's myself, my partner, um, any of the other lawyers we work with, we're available, right? So um, but we have to structure, you know, we have to sort of set those boundaries, set those limits. Because if we didn't, that would be completely untenable. And that's the productization. I think that's where it kind of comes in with this is in, this is out. You know. Yeah, and Erin Levine, who her ears must have been itching because we're totally going to talk about you in a minute. Um, is, is she here? She is. She just said Sweet. it's a low enough amount that they won't feel bad if they don't use it for a month or two. Uh, right. Which is an interesting thing because, again, thinking about the portfolio, going back to Ed Kless's point about you want to think about the portfolio, not the individual client, uh, and in terms of – yeah, expenses and income or whatever. For you, if you've got a thousand people at ninety five dollars a month, you know, who cares if one person calls too much because you're making ninety five thousand exactly. dollars a month. And what's kind of cool is is you know it varies. So like you know if someone what's I really like being able to um, if someone has really high needs one month, you know they're going through something, right? I've had conversations where they're like, I feel like I'm calling you too much. I'm so sorry. I'm like, hey, don't worry about it. We got you because the, because then what happens is we have a really good relationship with them. They like us for a long time. They continue to like us and they refer people. So really it goes from being like, how much money can I make from this person to how much can I help this person? Mm. Because that's what our product is, you know? Speaking of, I mean, I think that's interesting for getting again to the portfolio idea because you're using this, even if it's a Costco chicken, right? It's a loss leader that gets people into the Costco to pay too much for, uh, pillows that you don't need and dishes that sit in the garage because we don't actually. Use. Okay, this is about me. I'm talking about <laughs> the way we. Spend well, that's how Costco. Costco works. Yeah, freaking bastards. Anyway, it even if this is a loss leader type thing, there's still value to it because you've got a valve out to other things. Are you using yeah. it that way? Like, no. if if somebody says this is ninety five dollars a month, it's not enough work. Or, or it's not enough coverage for me. I want to do more of like a retainer type. I want to call yeah. you more. I want to do more work. Do you have that exit valve for so, people to move them up? So, so generally, um, you know, not, our, our subscription program isn't a loss leader. I mean, it's a profit center, right? So that's not, we're not sort of looking to sell them anything else. And that's kind of one of, part of the design is we want it to be self-sufficient. In fact, you know, from the day one, it's been like, what if we cut away everything else we did and just had a subscription, how would that look? And the answer is just fine, no problem, right? Um, so what that kind of does is it keeps us from having to sell things. And and then, you know, if somebody really needs something, we can say, hey, 
you know, we suggest that you go and you register a trademark. Now you can do it right now or you can wait six months. We right. don't really care, like, but we're going to give you the advice that you need to make that decision, you know, but like for us, it's not like, you know, we've got to get people to buy other things in order to make our money back, you mm. know, it's standalone. There is no loss leader part of it. Yeah. And Aaron just restated, it goes from how much money can I get from this person to how much can I help them? That's what it has to be. Yeah. Cause if, if you're looking at each individual person as how much money can I get, it's not going to work. You know, and it's, it seems kind of weird. I mean, it seems like a, you know, counterintuitive. Well, you're running a business. Don't you want to earn money? Yeah, I do. But I want to do it in a way that people are happy to continue paying. But right? for this, this specific kind, though, for it to, to, when you're talking about portfolio risk, right, and spreading that risk across a portfolio. So somebody takes too many hours, it's okay because I've got mm -hmm. 100 other people who are paying who aren't taking too much time. You have to get to a certain scale yeah. before that math starts bouncing Absolutely. out, or each client is just a super high risk. So w tell me about that relationship. Do you think if you were trying to be more the concierge kind of lawyer for, you know, you'd have to have a smaller stable of people um, and you'd have to charge more, right? Yeah, it, it depends. I mean, you can scale what, what this offers. I mean, you know, that said, I mean, you know, if, if my thing was, hey, you know, anything that comes up, you know, any legal work that happens, whether it's registering a trademark, setting up a company, we'll do it. Um, the price would be like, let's say a thousand bucks a month, you know, something like that, you know, and we've thought about that. Like, is that the way to do it? And I'm like, no, like, I actually really like not, I like having it all spread out. I like having, you know, like you're saying this sort of portfolio risk, it's diversified. So again, right. if, if there's someone who is really hard to deal with, I'm not depending upon their money every month. Which would be hard to do if it was just you, right? Like if, if, if it were what for you as one person to scale, to take on a thousand people, um, mm -hmm. that sounds like it'd be a lot of work, but you've got the ability to send some of, you know, if something blows up, you as an yeah. owner have the ability to send somebody to other counsel if they need it, right? Like Absolutely. Yeah, so we have, we have an internal team. You know, we have, um, you know, our internal lawyers. We have contract attorneys that we work with. But then, you know, like I was saying earlier, if it's a specialized matter. So um, specialized matters that happen, again, music law, securities law, um, litigation. Those are ones where we have a bunch of attorneys who we've worked with and who our clients like and share our values and we just send them to them, you know? And, and, and again, you know, I think what people get if they're a subscriber is that value is, I know that this referral is good. I know that I can count on them to send me to someone really good. I think when you and I, when I was drafting the book, which you make an appearance in the book, uh, I think when I was right, uh, you know, first writing the book, you and I had a long conversation about, how how you turn the my firm way into a product and how you capture that value so i want to talk to you about that but first Sweet. i want to uh aaron says i agree our 99 dollars a month is a profit maker now i'll shut up and listen to you smarties and then not 20 seconds later she put another message i love you aaron she said sorry i can't stop michael i agree for concierge service needed yeah, keep it model. coming or a different cause. So because we don't want Aaron to shut up, we're going to make her the center of the show right now. Be I, so just to get nerdy, John, you and I have talked about this. Uh, at the book, I go into this difference between a scaling entrepreneurial kind of business and the sort of ways that you, this, how you productize is part of that question. Yeah. Um, and, and is sort can be driven by that. Do you define yourself that way versus do you define yourself as an expert where you're the mm -hmm. show, not your system. You are the show. You're the smarty. How you productize. I want to show you two different, you guys, two different examples of how to productize based on which of those businesses you are. So John, real quick, I'm going to share the screen and talk about Aaron's uh, for a second. So uh, this is Aaron Levitt. This is Hello Divorce. And hers is an interesting, she's got these different price tiers and largely, and Aaron, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it I think most of what changes the different tiers is how much human involvement there is, right? Like how much, how hard it is to sort of scale the, to scale the thing. And what's interesting about this is Aaron is in building this, lower and lower touch for her, right? Like in terms of legal counsel, she's not doing a lot of, hey, let me talk to you about your, did dad bring the blanket back last night, right? She's pulling hmm. herself out of that. Aaron says, just as long as I, I don't have to get on camera, I just got out of the shower. I think the secret, Aaron, in the apocalypse is to never shower. I'm not saying that personally, but I heard. Um, 
But yeah, over time, she's pulling herself out, right? So this is productized in a way that her process becomes the point of value. And we're going to talk about the My Firm way with Aaron in a minute, too. Uh, Aaron, am I allowed to talk about expansion of Hello Divorce? You can answer that. I don't want to talk about expansion if I'm not allowed to. Um, but I want to give a contrast to Megan, Xavier. And here's she, it, Megan has a different business model. She's the show um, in her firm. She's not trying to pull herself out. She's trying to grow herself, make her impact wider. And so she's got traditional state bar defense, but she's also got flat fee probation compliance, flat fee you give her your moral character application thingy for your bar. Uh, Aaron, does that yes refer to tech to expansion? Can I talk about expansion? Um, she's got these flat fee productized. Once she figures it out, it she can do it again and again. And Megan also, John, I think you probably saw this. Megan added a subscription product. And it's interesting when I'm thinking because... Aaron is a subscription. Hello Divorce is a subscription product that is paying monthly for the process. Megan is a sub has a subscription product that is paying monthly for access to her brain, right? Mm -hmm. And those people pay for access to her brain even if they never use. They just want. It's the more like the traditional retainer thing. So, I I say all that to say, John, I want you to talk about. Um, I want you to talk about how your business model might feed into the way you de would design the productizing. Okay. Um, you know, I th and correct me if I'm kind of going in the wrong direction here, but um, the way I'm sort of hearing it is, you know, I, I think what we're, what we're trying to do is make it so that whether I'm the one fulfilling, you know, the, the legal needs or someone on my team or a completely different person is fulfilling these needs. It, doesn't matter, right? So we're going to have a system. We're going to have, you know, here's how we do it, you know. And so we're talking about, you know, right now one of our, our big challenges is bringing on more attorneys to, to sort of help. As we expand our client base, we need more attorneys to review contracts and answer questions. And so what we're doing right now is, hey, here's how you interact with, with clients, right? And so, you know, a lot of attorneys know how to do that. So they're like, yeah, yeah, we get it. But, you know, there are specific things like that, you know, that we want to make sure, like make sure they go away feeling like they were helped, Right. That's a very simple thing. So, you know, make sure that they feel like they got something out of every phone call, even if the, your answer is, I don't know, you know, right. give them something that they're happy with um, so that, you know, they stick around and aren't like, yeah, I called those guys and they didn't know what they were doing. You know, so regardless, we have to make sure that people are happy. So I think what we're trying to do right now is just sort of replicate the best of what we've been doing, what we found has been effective in our practice, and then uh, turn that into a system, turn that into a system that any attorney can be brought into, mm. um, you know, and, and, and it helps them also because they don't have to make those decisions. They don't have to think about, oh, like, do, you know, what do I do here? Like, we're like, hey, here's, you know, here's sort of what we found that works for the customers who are on this subscription. Yeah. And I think, I mean, to, to get Back to the book, I, there's a whole section on the your firm way. If you're this kind of business, this kind of firm where you're trying to figure out how to scale and how to, you know, create all these process, what you're selling is the system. Yeah. You, you can actually get to the point where you're bringing in other, like in other jurisdictions, you can sell the yeah. my firm way. And I talk about how Amazon did this with their with their shipping. So, so I'll, you know, uh, I'm going to, for Aaron, I'm going to talk high level. And I know John, you and I talked about this as well in terms of asset building your firm on assets. Aaron now has the ability now that she's created a whole ton of assets and all these processes, she has the ability to go into a completely different jurisdiction and say, Hey, you lawyer in Maine, I don't know why that would be Aaron's first choice from California to Maine, but Hey, you lawyer in Maine, uh, we want to do hello divorce here in Maine. We need somebody here. Uh, can can we use you to duplicate the my firm way? You know the hello divorce yeah. way. Now you've got a thing of value, and for you, you know, counsel for creators whether you want to expand that into other jurisdictions, or in the future you just want to sell your firm. Like I don't think Megan is ever going to try to sell her firm. That that wouldn't make a lot of sense for Megan's design because she's the brain. And as long as people, she keeps providing brain, people will keep paying her. But for you, you'll have the ability to pull yourself out of this, right? Yeah, I mean, that, that's the idea. I mean, it's it's kind of going from, you know, m from myself, the journey has been from being a lawyer, which obviously I am and have been for a while now, um, to being a business owner, right? So it's like, that's 
taking me out of the equation, right? And so even from day one, you know, I didn't call it Tobin Law for a reason, right? Because with Tobin Law, people want to talk with me, right? And I, you know, I, while I'm happy to talk with them, I also want it to be like they, they're happy to talk with someone else on my team, right? So that, you know, if I hire someone else, because I think they're really good and they share my approach, I want someone to call and not be disappointed that they're not talking with me. I want mm-hmm. them to be happy that they're talking with someone I hired because I think they can do the job. Hmm. So let's think about specific products. Um, uh, Aaron added quality control is a huge issue. Yeah. I, I think, it, again, I, I, I don't want to make John just have to rehash the book, but I, you know, I talk about for this kind of business, for John and Aaron's kind of business, which is very service oriented. It's about an audience. His, his firm is called Council for Creators. Like it's for a kind of person and yeah. dealing with multiple problems in that kind of person. For those people, you know, quality control is huge. The four competencies are design, source, build, and deliver. And build has to do with making sure that every time you're getting that consistent experience, right? Um, and people who do this work hate to be compared to McDonald's because every lawyer thinks they're a special snowflake. But really, you're trying to do it so that sort of anybody you plug into this can do it as well as mm-hmm. you can, can duplicate you. Or better. Yeah, exactly. I want, I want them to do better than I can. Yeah. Uh, that's impossible, John Tobin. Believe um, me, it's possible. <laughs> so... Um, so yeah, and and Chelsea uh, Williams makes the point. I love the business blueprint with a genuine concern for the client. I I, I think once you figure out that business blueprint, that my firm way, you it's it's really cool because now you can, as I always say, it's easier to manage paper than people, and so you can keep changing these assets, these these systems that you've created so that so that they deliver consistently. So I want to talk to you, John, about specific products, right? So mm-hmm. how might I go into this design? designing for solutions, right? Like if, are you basing this on as you're adding things, is it based on client feedback or that are you doing questionnaires to them that say, Hey, what else do you want us to do? Or are you just sort of tracking? These are the kinds of questions we're getting over and over again. How are you deciding what should be the basis of this solution? What am I trying to solve? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I think with any business that you want to grow, feedback is like the critical part, right? So it's just this feedback loop where you iterate. So you don't start with, you know, here's my master, you know, here's my master plan and I'm going to execute that master plan. You start with, here's a small thing I'm going to try, right? And I'm going to see how people like it. Um, if people don't like it, I'll do less of that. If people do like it, I'll do more of it. Right. And so it's, it's super simple, but it's hard to sort of keep in mind. Right. So the way we do it is we collect feedback. Right. So we, um, I think it's either quarterly or monthly, like we, you know, just do general like NPS. So we'll send everybody a survey, say, Hey, you know, how likely would you be to recommend us to a friend? And if we see it going down, okay, general, we have a general problem. We look at, um, you know, any of the financial numbers can tell us that. So that gives us a broad picture. But for specifically what we want to do, like what do we need to respond to? Yeah, it's often client questions. So, you know, if we're getting a question a lot. So, for instance, we were getting a lot of questions in the last month, obviously, about applying for PPP loans and unemployment. So we made videos about that. You know, we just responded to what our clients wanted. Um, and so then when they see that, they're like, that's awesome. And, you know, um, you know, when I get on the phone with people, you know, they, you know, they tell me, hey, we really like the video that you did on this. That was really cool. We look at the statistics. So if somebody, you know, we have Vimeo. And so like if somebody, um, if some, if one video is more popular, we make more of those. Mm-hmm. If it's less popular, we do less. If we see people drop off halfway, okay, what was going on? You know, and so you always have to be sort of self-critical and not take it personally because, you know, if, if let's say that you have 10 ideas and five are good and five are bad, cut the five that are bad and, do more of the five that are good. It's sort of like this almost like evolutionary model. So I, a creating content qualifies for what we're talking about in the sense that yeah. there's work up front and it gives you value down a long tail over time. Right. Yeah, that's right. So similar it, it, again, we're trying to make a distinction between hourly services or services, which is you get paid, then you do the work. This is sort mm-hmm. of the opposite. You do the work and it and provides value over time. So that's the distinction we're making. So content qualifies yeah. for that. But with the PPP loan, which is a complex um, maybe example because the government had limitations of who could support, who could help with this. But theoretically, yeah. if you have a situation like the PPP loan, if that's coming up enough, you as a firm could have said, 
you know what? I'm going to provide a flat fee service for helping people provide, you know, go apply. If we wanted to. Yeah. Right. So how do you think through that? How do you, how do you decide what should be included in this? What should, what, what can we not do? What's outside of our firms? You know, what we're trying to do, how do you decide what to make it look like? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, uh, you know, I think we always start with what talent and expertise do we have available. So even on the PPP loan, right, we can provide like resources and some insight and, you know, breakdowns. And so like actually what we did with with a lot of these loan programs is we have, um, you know, one of our colleagues is a tax planner, a tax professional. So we do, we were doing videos with him and being like, Hey, you know, let's just talk, let's just talk about this. Like, tell us what's going on with this. Tell us, you know, what are the deadlines? What do people need to have? What's a financial statement? Do all that stuff. Right. So if we don't have the expertise, we bring it in. So that's one thing is just who can we, you know, get. So, you know, again, if, if we didn't know anybody, we just probably wouldn't say anything about it because I don't know that much about it, but I want to bring someone else who does. Right. So that's number one. Um, number two is again, just what do what are people looking for? What kind of questions are are we getting? You know, so you know, if I start seeing a pattern where a lot of people are calling or sending me emails about a specific issue, that tells me, hey, think about this. Think about whether or not you need to turn this into a piece of content, right? Um, so everything that we we've, we've created is based on getting repeat questions. So trademark is easy. I can tell you the twenty top twenty trademark questions we get. I could make five minute videos to answer each one. You know, I give this example all the time, and I'm sorry, guys, for repeating myself. But Jess Birkin is an interesting example of what you just described because she asked herself, "What are our internal capacities?" And yeah. hey, I don't do this thing. She kept getting asked about. She serves nonprofits in Minnesota. She's got a pretty defined vertical, and she, they kept asking about employee handbooks. And right. So she had to make this decision, like, either I say, no, I'm not going to do employee handbooks, or I, Jess Birkin, I'm going to go learn how to do employee handbooks. And she's like, screw that. I don't want to do that. So we found another solution, which was we went on Law Clerk. She created a team to say, That's awesome. here's how you do this process. Here's a form to use for intake. Here's the questions you need to ask. And then here's how you turn it into a... Do- well, then instead of her doing that, what she does now is she just goes back and hires that team. So now yeah. in terms of her service offerings, she has a productized, defined. That's awesome. The team is a strategic asset. That group of people is a strategic asset that she has right now because she can turn around every time somebody asks about this. She can be like, yeah, we do that. Yeah. And then just go pay somebody else. So I guess my point is, even if you don't have in-house the capacity that does not mean this is not a product you can't you can't design and serve with. Yeah. On the flip side, you don't have to say yes to everything. If if no. you hate the thing people are asking you to do, or you can't figure out how to make a profit at it, just because your audience asks you to do it, doesn't mean you have to do it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the one of the things you know early on, like I remember my partner and I, we were like we used to do like walking meetings, right? And so we're walking along the street talking about okay, like what do we want to offer? And so we're kind of like using the analogy of. Do we want to be one of those restaurants who has like 80, 80 different dishes right. and they're all okay? Or do we want we want to have like four or five things we do really well and that's what people come to us for? And we chose the latter. You know, we chose to be like, hey, let's focus on what we're really good at and only do that. Right. You know, to the point of just, you know, excluding anything else. Even if they're, even if we do see that there's an opportunity or someone has money, you know, we're like, nah, you know, I'd rather not take it. I'd rather not do an okay job on it. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, Making those decisions about where the boundaries are is business model design. That's right? what like, it is. That's, yeah. that's the hard work of deciding who we are and who we aren't. And to be clear, it's totally freaking arbitrary, right? Like mm-hmm. if you decide I don't like that thing, you're a business owner. You have the power to do that. Yep. So for Jess to make that decision of, well, this is actually in our wheel. I don't know how to do it, but it's – it's in our it's in bounds for us, but that's a business model choice and 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 she she led that Aaron uh said, "Gosh, I hope you turn this into a blog post uh or I guess maybe this week I need to actually read your book. The answer is yes, Aaron Libby. <laughs> I need to read the damn book um but yeah i as I've thought about this stuff and I've been thinking about it for a while. One of the things that's really difficult for lawyers is most of us don't have design backgrounds. We don't have project management backgrounds. It's really difficult for us to say, this is what the client wants. This this is how I design around that. This is how I make sure the quality control is there. And in the book, I argue that you should get somebody with that competency, not yeah. necessarily expect yourself to have that. But you have some of that background. If 
how do you do that? Do you have somebody else in your firm that's helping you with the design side and the customer feedback side? Or do you feel like because of your pre-law background, you're okay doing this yourself? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm happy to sort of be behind all the design, right? So I was a designer before I was a, um, a lawyer. And so that makes it easy. So obviously my job also is I want to delegate as much as possible. So I don't want to be sitting there making all the graphics. Um, but if push comes to shove and we're like, Hey, we need something tomorrow. Like we're doing a session or for our newsletter or whatever, I can just get in there and knock something out. Right. So that's been, you know, really helpful Sorry, or with technical stuff. Yeah. Let me, uh, I don't mean design in the sense of doing graphic design in the sense well, of designing the product. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and as, as, yeah, I'm about to get to that, which is okay. also just, you know, like I can sort of have the initial ideas and then I can bring someone else to help me refine them. So, you know, kind of what I'm, what I'm saying is, you know, part of being a business owner is also knowing when to delegate, mm. you know? So if I think if I didn't have any of those, any of those experiences, I would probably have to delegate all of it. Right. You know, just be like, Hey, here's, here, here's generally what I'm trying to do. Translate that into a product. You know, I want to make it so that people have access to a lawyer. You know, how, how do you sort of set up that feedback loop? You know? Yeah, it's um, sort of all the rage right now to talk about design thinking in law. I mean, in everything, it's become like this uh, yeah. sort of over overdone Dilbert cartoon thing. But um, and it's great. I mean, I don't, I, I wouldn't knock design thinking, but I will say it's a competency and it's a learned thing. And yeah. you got to make the decision of somebody's got, yeah, somebody's got to do it well. And either yeah. it's going to be you or you're going to get somebody else. But it, somebody's got to do it well. And what's cool is you can actually learn the basics really quickly. So my partner, one of the reasons we, we get along so well, and I think we've been so good as a team is, um, you know, he went to general assembly and took a course in uh, product management. So, you know, there it is. And so, you know, a lot of that comes in. And again, it's not like he went to like a four year university or has a PhD in any of this. It's just, we know enough right. where then we can also see the limitations of our knowledge. We're like, we're not going to try to do that because we really don't know how to do that. So like things like analytics, I know what it does. I know how it works. Um, I'm not going to do it. I'm not a math person. I don't have that ability to actually get in there and sort of figure all this stuff out. Just a reminder, guys, you can ask questions uh, below, make comments about things that you're adding, you're trying. Um, John, we talk about this in our session. I think part of what prompted me to really want to talk to you about this is a lot of people are making the decision to change practice areas right now. Mm. So, for example, you've got a lot of you know, DUI lawyers that are like, well, crap, right? Like, that's not working out right now. I should shift to bankruptcy. Um, I'm curious about how you think through, should I productize what I know so I'm delivering in a different way? Because like, we can't go to court right now, fine. Right. That's a that's a supply problem, not necessarily a demand problem. Um, is there some other way for me to meet the demand or should I just jump practice areas and, and start over with my knowledge and pull over what I can? Do you have any advice for people thinking through that right now? Yeah, I mean, it's obviously I think the answer is going to depend upon the person. It's going to depend upon the practice area. Um, you know, I've, I've heard, you know, and I think we talked about this before. I mean, you hear the sort of suggestion given pretty um, loosely like, oh, just switch practice areas as if it's just something anybody can do. Right. It's not something anybody can do. And it's not something that people should necessarily want to do. I mean, I don't know what the solution is if, you know, the thing you're doing is just completely dried up. But, you know, to go from being a DUI lawyer to being a trusts and estates lawyer, um, probably possible, but isn't going to be possible in the course of a couple of weeks or to pay in the mortgage for next month. You know what I mean? So um, what you can do is maybe partner with someone, you know, I think. And again, this is why, you know, generally companies and partnership partnerships exist because, you know, you're going to have ups and downs and they might not necessarily be at the same time. So, you know, if, if, if one thing is down, the other might be up or you, it's again, diversifying the skill set. So it is, you are kind of in a, in a jam if you have just one, you know, sort of one skill set that you've been relying on. And I don't necessarily know how I'd get out of that. I mean, I might take that same knowledge. So if I'm a DUI attorney, is there something I could do, you know, as a DUI attorney that can still help people that people would pay for? Um, the answer is, I don't know. I'm not a DUI attorney, but if someone is, maybe they do know that, Hey, you know, people who have DUIs need to like check in with the court. So I'm going to make that easier or whatever it is, you know, whatever it is that they have to do, you know? Yeah. And I, again, a thing that I've said a lot during this thing is a practice area is not a niche. It's a bundle of services. And yeah. as soon as that 
bundle of services isn't available anymore. Now you're like, well, crap, I don't have. But if you're like John, where you have a, a, an audience niche, right, this vertical positioning, his people want, like, let's just pretend trademarks totally go away. Uh, Brian L. Fry wins and plagiarism doesn't matter. And there's no, let's say there's no copyright or whatever. Right. Let's say that all goes away. If you thought of John's practice as a bundle of services, well, now he's screwed. But if you think of it as he's helping certain people, well, those certain people are going to have other questions, right? Other issues. And there's always other issues. And again, even if I don't have the competency, let's just say that, you know, they said, okay, John, you can't do trademark, you can't do business formation. Um, We'd still get by because what we would do is we'd be like, okay, well, what's another thing that people have asked us about? You know, and if it's, you know, even if it's something I don't know, like, let's just say small business accounting, I'm going to go and I'm going to try to find someone who's really good at it. And then I'm going to use the system we've built to make sure people can get, can get accounting help, you know, or whatever it is, you know, it doesn't really matter, but it's more just how can we serve this group of people. And so, you know, again, I, I think if somebody is, um, I'm trying to think, I, I, I was trying to think of like a good example with like a DUI lawyer, you know, like what would the market be? I mean, I don't know. Maybe people who are trying to change their lives for the better, this you know, like, why, hey, I'm tired I mean, of getting I, these DUIs, tired of all these things happening because I drink, you know, I want to change. It's maybe so tough because I, you know, I feel, and I had this conversation with Mark Homer, a lot of the angst that people feel right now is just chickens coming home to roost. Like you sh- Frankly, you should not have built on churn and cash flow and these bundles of services that were relying on other people in the first place. You know, that's not an asset driven business. This is like, this is why this moment is why building that way is so hard because when you can't deliver that dry cleaning and, you know, if you're a dry cleaner and that's all you do and you can't dry clean clothes, well, now you're, you're pooched. But if you have an audience or you've built up because you focused on a problem a bunch of content assets or or right. a th- you know known expertise that still has value. Um, I wanted to pull over from Aaron. She said, "John, do you think it's important for a lawyer who wants to start a subscription-based product to understand basics in marketing, design, sales, coding? Like, if you're that kind of lawyer that wants to be the service, so again, not Megan Xavier, more Aaron." How much should the owner, should the person at sort of at the top of this, spend learning those business competencies? Is their job now, like for you, is your job more now business owner or lawyer? Right, um, 80% business owner. So, and, and what that involves is just knowing enough about, about the areas that are involved so that you can bring in the right person, right? So you want to be educated enough. So even if you're not going to go and learn about market research. You're ne- you know you're never going to be an expert. You do want to know, like, how do I evaluate the person who I'm going to bring in? How do I know if someone's giving me a load of hot air, you know, and they're just saying a bunch of buzzwords off the internet? Or is this the real deal? You know, is this the person I can rely on to get this done? And so, you know, like a good place you might see this is in a lot of digital marketing or SEO. Everybody has these you know, solutions and products and this and that. And so it's really hard to cut through. The way you cut through is learning enough yourself. So just go on, you know, Amazon or wherever, grab three books on SEO and l- learn, like know enough so that you're not going to be taken advantage of by somebody, you know? And so you don't yeah. like, and, and again, if you like something, if there's something that's essential to like what you do and you like it and it's really driving, you know, a lot of your growth, obviously you can go like really deep into it. Yeah. We were talking about this with, um, uh, actually, it was Conrad Sam wrote an article that a lot of these marketing companies are giving you, you know, how competitive you are on searches based on branded searches. So, like, yeah. is your name coming up when somebody looks for your name? And and he was pointing like pointing out that a lot of firm or a lot of these marketing companies are using that to say, hey, we're so good at search. You come up when you search your name, and and you know if you, you don't better. if yeah. you don't have the basic competency to know what the heck a branded search is, right. Uh, you've got an issue. I want to go back to the beginning to one of Jonathan's questions that's related to this. Um, he said, when you first started your subscription program, what was your marketing approach? How were you getting people? Were you taking existing clients and saying, hey, we got this cool new thing? Did you have a whole different marketing approach for this? How did you get started with it? Yeah, it was largely word of mouth. I mean, it was largely um, clients who I already had. Um, it, you know, And actually, the subscription itself came as a response to client questions, right? And so, you know, I always sort of tell the story of one of the things that sort of drove us to do it is people would come to us 
six months after a problem happened. And at that time, we were like billing hourly or whatever, just doing the standard kind of thing. Um, people would come to us like six months later and be like, okay, so now I have this crazy problem that's blown up. And I'm like, you do realize that like with like a 10 minute conversation six months ago, this never would have happened. You know, you would have had a good strategy. So that happened a number of times where I'm like, wait, we should make it easy. And like the, the obviously the thing that people didn't like is I don't know how much it's going to cost. You know, it's, it's, uh, you know, I don't know, like I'm going to call you. It's going to be 200 bucks. It's going to be 800 bucks. I don't really know. And I'm like, yeah, I get that. I wouldn't want to buy that either, you know? And so we're like, how can we make this predictable? How can we make this, you know, something where, people can get it. So yeah, we told our, all our clients, we have a mailing list and we say, Hey, we're doing this thing. If you guys want to try it, get on there. And that's what happened. Yeah. And I think, boy, this is easy for me to say because I'm not in this position, but I feel like, again, we're talking about when you productize, most of the work is front loaded and, yeah. and the value comes to you later. We as lawyers don't tend to do that because we come out and we start charging two hundred dollars an hour or whatever from day one. Yeah, and, we're and it seems like a lot hour. of money. Yeah, and so now we're like, I'm going to spend two uh, ten hours on this thing, and a lot of lawyers. I don't know if you've seen this, John, but a lot of lawyers are they go to some conference and they're persuaded I should make a course, right? Mm. And they'll go make a video course and they'll spend you know two weeks making this video course and learning all these things, and then they put it out to crickets because yeah. Nobody can like nobody's looking for you right now. So that makes people feel like this sort of productized approach is a bad idea. How how might you advise somebody who feels like it's not worth doing this work up front? How do you make sure that it's worth it long term? Yeah, I mean I, I think kind of going back to what you said a little bit ago, it's about changing your your mindset from being lawyer to business owner. It's almost two separate jobs. You know, so when you're when you're working, it's like, am I being a business owner, which means I'm investing? I mean, every business, you don't see money on day one, you know, like maybe maybe some do. But generally, it's like it takes a ton of money, ton of time to make your first dollar. Right. right? So you can be like 50 grand in before you before anything comes out, you know. And so, like, if you're not willing to do that, you know, and I, I would joke before when I was first starting this, if you're not willing to, like, you know, go through some poverty. It's not going to happen, you know? Yeah, I was like Lee Rosen always talks about in his first year, he made $75 from his firm or something. And something it's, like that, yeah. And it's amazing when you think about that because you're like, his revenues were probably pretty high. But most businesses, they brag, we were profitable in the first two years, right? Like they're, they're not even turning profits until well, – you, you can be profitable on, on pretty quickly. Like, you know, With I mean, this, it's yeah, – sure. Well, I mean, just but I think generally, you know, you can because mm. because what you also want to do is you want to iterate. So I think what people, are, you know, again, this is sort of taking stuff from like design and software development background is you don't want to take what's called the waterfall approach where you be like, I'm going to have a course. It's this great like master plan. It's going to, you know, have like 500 lessons. I'm going to go and spend six months and build it and put it out to crickets. That's the wrong way. The right way is I'm going to um, maybe start a mailing list, um, see if I can build enough interest in the course cool. Wow. You know, like, Hey, you guys want to reserve? You can reserve for 20 bucks. If, if it's crickets, change the messaging. Okay. You guys want to reserve for 20 bucks. You get some people who are reserving or pay, prepaying. I mean, a lot of people who make courses, the way they do it actually is they, um, will have people who want to take the course prepay before they even make anything, you know, that way they know that's what the market research comes in. So it's, you know, you might have a good idea, but for whatever reason, people might not like it. Yeah. You know, or your messaging might just might not connect with them. And, you know, that's one of the things we're working on right now is tweaking the messaging ever so slightly, because that's the kind of stuff where, again, you can have one message where everyone's like, yeah, that, that's dumb. I don't know why I'd want that. Change the language. And everyone's like, wow, like, you know, please, can can I pay you right now for it? Right. So there's a lot to it. And so I'd say you iterate and you start small, like don't start huge. Uh, yeah, so uh, Chelsea points out uh, you got to weigh the ROIs in terms of what it's worth to put effort in and then get it out. Yeah. And I, I like this idea that John has of well, change that math right by by doing less upfront. To I've, yeah. I've even heard a come you know get these people who will who will say, hey guys, I here's a place where I'm gathering money, a hundred dollars or whatever per person. I'm just testing interest, yeah. and if I don't get to X amount of dollars. Uh, then uh, we're not going to do it. I'm, I'm going to cancel this thing yeah. and send you guys your. I won't make the videos. They're just testing interest. And what's the? That's what Kickstarter is. Yeah, I was going to say the Kickstarter does this with board games. Where like, yeah, I mean with everything. But 
I care about the board games. But, yeah. uh, you know, they'll go in there, and if they don't reach their target, they just send everybody their money. They back. don't do it. Um, yeah, and, and, and you can do that with a prepay. I mean, and, and the reason, like, you do, like, a prepay for courses or whatever is is people will tell you, oh, it's a good idea, right? They'll say, oh, that sounds cool. I can't wait for you to make that course. Really easy to say, right? Very different story to put in your credit card number. So you, wanna, you want that sort of feedback. True, true. Um, and finally, to wrap up, Aaron points out, I hate to make Mike's head any bigger, but this mm. is the most valuable chat I've heard in months. Well done, guys. Aaron, don't you worry. My kid's making brownies every night during the apocalypse is what's going to make my head bigger. So you don't even have to... You don't even have to worry about that. I don't. Fit, there. Yeah, I don't fit into any of the clothes I fit into three weeks ago. Okay, guys, what I want you to do is remember that this. Anytime you watch this in the future, you can still add comments and questions below. We can continue this conversation. Um, I have paid John a fortune to just come back and hang out with us over and over again. I've paid him nothing, um, but he just loves us. So uh, I, I, you know, we can answer questions about this into the future. So so keep adding to it, uh, John. If people want to follow up with you and maybe talk to you about how you've done this, is 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 there a good way to do? I I don't want to give away your time, but okay. Yeah, no. I mean, it's 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 fine. And actually, like one of my sort of vulnerabilities is I will talk about this incessantly to anybody who asks. So take advantage of it because I'm not charging for it because, you know, at this point I'm, you know, people will be like, Oh, like I learned so much. And I'm like, well, just, yeah, that's fine. Because I, I like sharing this stuff. I like talking about this stuff. So anyway, if you want to find me counselforcreators.com, that's our website. That's our firm website. If you want to find me on like social media, it's John Tobin LA on Twitter. Um, so those are like the, the two like good ways. And so, yeah, honestly, like if people contact me, I, you know, I'm happy to, you know, schedule a time to talk about any of this stuff just because I like seeing people do it and I want to help. So there we are. I appreciate that. And I think if I'm not mistaken, this is the last of all of the, uh, follow-ups to the conference. So that's the conference guys. What I hope you will do is go back. I know a lot of you have watched this Facebook live and then are going back and watching the YouTube videos. I hope that you will do that. You'll go, uh, uh, watch all that was created. And if you have not registered yet to see those videos, just go to lawyerforward.com slash virtual. You can still do it. And sort of for me, um, I think the next step might be to get the book and the lawyer forward and just to read through it and start mapping out what your business is going to look like. Do you want to focus on expertise or do you want to focus on accessibility and building around an audience? How do you connect people? How do you, you know, make sure that you build around the different resources? So a lot of the work that John's done and a lot of our other guests have done. So um, thank you to all of the guests and specifically to you, John. I appreciate your time on a Saturday. Now go yeah, play with your kids, man. Go play. Yeah, will do. I'm uh, on my way. I appreciate you, man. Have a great day. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.